This week we begin the book of Shemot on page 292 in the Stone Chumash, uh, Exodus 1 1. These are the names of the Jewish children who came to Mitzrayim Ruven, Shimon, Levi, Yehuda, Yisachar. Rashi says, We know there are no extra words in the Torah, Avi. We know who they are. We know that the Bnei Yaakov are Ruven, Shimon, Levi, Yehuda. Why repeat it again? There's no repetition in the Torah. What is the message of Exodus 1-1 on 292 in the Stone Chumash? And why the Torah has to repeat all the names of the children of Yaakov? We know them already. We've been following the story for the past few weeks. So Rashi says something amazing. Even though in, in last week's parsha, in the end of Echim, Aigash, the brothers are still alive. So even though they're dead now, says Rashi, you might think when a person dies, he ceases to exist. He loses his identity. So Rashi says, no, even though now they're dead. In Exodus, they're dead. To teach that Ruven remains Ruven, Shimon remains Shimon, etc. When a person dies, he continues to exist in Olam Abba, and his identity is not lost. And I wouldn't know that unless the Torah repeats Reuven, Shimon, Levi even after they're dead. And Rashi says the Jewish people are compared to the stars. We all shine on. Just like the stars are eternal, the Jewish people are eternal. And even after death, we retain who we are. Our identity is not lost. Reuven remains Reuven. Shimon remains Shimon, even though he's no longer inside his bodysuit. And that's why the Torah repeats their names even after they're dead. That's pretty amazing. Now, Hanoch mentioned this morning to me uh, the word Hateva. Little Moshe is placed in Hateva. In, uh, in the uh, Stone Chumash, it's page uh, 296. 296. Uh, Exodus 2 verse 5 Bas Paroi Exodus 2 verse 5 Bas Paroi goes down to bathe and she sees Ha Teva Abi have a book she sees Ha Teva Exodus 2 verse 5 in the Stone Chumash it's 296 she sees the box with the, with the Hey Ayedia that word is found only one other time in Pasha's Noah when God tells Noah to build the Queen Mary, he says, build Ha Teva. Now, Noah understood Hebrew. How do you say a huge ship? You say a Svina, you say a Nia. So why does the same word for Teva, little basket, the same word for Queen Mary? And with the extra Heya Yidia, says the Zohar to teach that Noah and Moshe are what? Were the same Neshama. Otherwise, it would make no sense why God would call the Queen Mary or the Titanic Ha Teva with the Hey idea, which Ha in Hebrew means a little box. But the Zohar says to connect that Noah and Moshe were a reincarnation of each other. And therefore, both of them were born circumcised. Both of them were born circumcised. So why did Moshe, why did Noah have to come back as Moshe Rabbeinu? Chanoch, why? Noah was not met Palel for his generation, right? He didn't daven at all. So he had to come back as Moshe Rabbeinu, who did not stop being mispalel for the people. That was his tikkun. Noah could not, didn't, you know, you say a, a Yiddish a tzaddik impels, you know, I'm okay, you're okay. He didn't mispalel for the generation. He's only concerned about himself, so he comes back as does the tikkun as Moshe Rabbeinu, when Moshe Rabbeinu's entire life mission is what? To be mitpalel for the generation. That was his tikkun, and therefore both Noah and Moshe were born, uh, were born what? Circumcised. So you see, it ain't over till it's over. A person doesn't do his tikkun, God says, you can pay me now, Avi, or you can pay me later, right? But the tikkun has to be, the tikkun has to be made. Now, Hanoch asked me again another great question before. Why did the Jewish people suffer more than any other nation? Are we worse than all other nations? Why are we persecuted and punished more than any other nation? Well, that question, Hanoch, is asked by Moshe Rabbeinu in this week's parasha. 
In this week's parsha, in the book, again, in the same parsha that we have, there's an amazing verse. Moshe Rabbeinu, Hashem tells him at the burning bush. Before that, when Moshe Rabbeinu, he what? He kills the Mitzri. The Mitzri is what? Beating up a Jew to death. And Moshe saves the life of the uh, Jew by killing the Mitzri. And page 298 in the Stone Chumash, verse 14. Exodus 2, verse 14. So Moshe Rabbeinu, after killing the Mitzri, he went out the next day, page 299, uh, verse 13. You had that, uh, He went out the next day, two Hebrew men were fighting. He said to the wicked one, why are you striking your fellow? Verse 14, he replied, who made you boss? Who, do you want to murder me as you murdered the Mitzri? Moshe was frightened and he thought, indeed, the matter is known. What is Moshe saying, the matter is known? What does that mean? So a push-up shot means that uh, these guys ratted me out. Right? I thought nobody saw me kill the Mitzri. Now they saw me and they snitched to the KGB. I'm in trouble. Indeed, the matter is known. But Rashi makes an amazing comment. Indeed, the matter is known, says Rashi on this pasuk. Moshe wondered, why the Jewish people have to suffer? and are persecuted and punished more than all the other nations. We're not worse than the other nations. So Moshe says, now I know the matter. Why we suffer more? Because the Jewish people slander each other. They snitch on each other. They go to the UN and they go around Europe like breaking the silence in J Street, slandering the Am Yisrael. Now Moshe Rabbeinu says, now I know why we are punished more than all the other nations. It's an amazing Rashi. Moshe wondered why we're worse than other nations. But we're punished more, says Rashi. Moshe Rabbeinu says, now the matter is known because I see that what? That there's slander and, how do you say snitching in English? Ratting each other out. And therefore, says Moshe, we deserve to be punished more than all the other nations. Rashi quotes Chazal on this page for, uh, in Pasuk 14. And this, this is the, we have it today. Mm -hmm. Nothing has changed. You have J Street, you have Breaking the Silence, who run all over the world, slandering and besmirching the state of Israel. Nothing has changed in 3,300 years. And we want to know why we suffer so much, says Rashi, because we have these slanderers, whether you call them Breaking the Silence or J Street or B'Tselem, it's Jew slandering Jew. And therefore Moshe says, now I know the matter is known to me why we have to suffer more than all the other nations, yes? Could another answer be also that um, we refuse to assimilate to the values of the whole society? So why should we suffer? So then feel, it's a good thing. So they always feel threatened. So why should we suffer? We if we refuse to assimilate, so why are we punished? Because why are we punished if we refuse to? represent a threat. So why are we punished? So why does God allow us to be punished? So Rashi says, the punishment is because I always wondered, are we worse than the 70 nations? But now I see why, because we have this land. There's no other nation that has such a, 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 a you know, the, you see a, a peace now movement among the Arabs? Are there any Arabs that, you know, that go to the UN and say how bad the Arabs are to Israel? Huh? This phenomenon, which Rav Havetchi called the Dosan Ve'aviram syndrome, haunts the Jewish people throughout history. What symptom? The Datan Ve'aviram syndrome. Exactly. They were the original J Streeters. Datan Ve'aviram, these are the guys that ratted out Moshe Rabbeinu. They went to Pharaoh and they snitched on him. And, uh, and this syndrome we have throughout Jewish history. Then they were called Datan Ve'aviram, today they're called J Street, or breaking the silence of B'Tselem. But the point is the same, to slander Israel in the eyes of the nations. So nothing much has changed in 3,300 years, and we have to be aware of it. And that's why Rashi quotes Chazal, why we suffer more than any other nation. Incredible Rashi. Yeah. Frightening, I would yeah. say. I yeah. would say. Very sad and very frightening, I think. So Moshe has to run for his life. He's a fugitive, right? He's on the run. 
He's a fugitive. And uh, so he runs from Midian because the KGB, from Mitzrayim, the KGB is looking for him, right? Thus on the Aviram, J Street ratted him out, went to the UN to snitch, that we're terrible. So Moshe had to run. He had to run to Midian. And where does he park himself? Page 299, Pasuk 16. Where does he park himself? By a well, right? Verse 15. Moshe sat by a well. Remember, he's a fugitive. He's on the run. Why is he sitting by a well? And who cares? The Torah, Adi, is GPS. The Torah is not a history book. We need to know that 3,331 years ago, Moshe Rabbeinu, as a fugitive, ran to Midian, and he happened to park himself by a well. So why do I care? Torah is not, the Torah is not history. The Torah is only what? GPS. Rashi makes a strange comment, Elisheva, very strange. He went to the, ve to, the, to the well, to the well, he went to the well. He learned from grandfather Yaakov, if you want to find a Shidduch, you go to the well. The well in those days was like the water cooler or the watering hole. I, want, I don't want to say bar, but he went to look for a Shidduch. Rashi makes this bizarre comment. He's a fugitive, he's on the run. Who's looking for the KGB, right? And, oh, by the way, I got to find a lot. I got to find my wife. So he went to the well. In the ancient world, that's where you what? Met your spouse. You understand this, Rashi? Yeah. I don't. <laughs> Come on, what do you mean? He's running for his life. Nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. So now he's thinking about a shidduch. Yeah, that's what uh, uh, Go ahead, Elisheva. It's true. He's a fugitive. Yeah, I know. So what's the message of Rashi? I don't know how you don't get that. Don't so tell me the message that. is, you want to get a life, get a wife. That's it. That's it. Moshe was in deep trouble. He needed someone to share his burden. No, he needed a home and a family. Uh, he needed a family. So because he was a fugitive, he couldn't carry the burden alone. He was looking for a spouse. A refuge. I think a powerful Rashi. Right? Uh -huh. <laughs> to get a life, you got to get a wife to share life's burdens. Otherwise, Rashi's very difficult what he's telling me about. He went to find a Shidduch. He went to find a Shidduch at a well. Right? It's a page 298 or 299, verse uh, 15 and 16. Now, that just begs the question, Hanoch, why, why? In the ancient world, you wanted to find a shidduch. You didn't go to a shotgun. You went to what? Well. A well. Why? What's the message? Because the women came and got more people. That's where people gathered. Right. It's networking. That's, network. That's network. Network. But it's deeper than that. You sitting down? It's also a good place to be a cow. <laughs> At a well, Avi, what do you do? You draw water. To draw water, you have to bend down. <coughs> the message is that you have to bend down to your spouse. You hear this? If you want a marriage to be successful, you've, like to draw water from a well, you bend down to draw the water. Successful marriage, you have to bend down to your spouse. Isn't that amazing? And this explains a strange Gemara Malka. The Gemara in Sota says that it's difficult to make a successful marriage like splitting in the Red Sea. Remember that Gemara in Sota Malka? Mm -hmm. yes. It's strange. What, is, what the heck does get, making a successful marriage got to do with splitting in the Red Sea? It's harder than. Well, it's, it's as difficult to make a successful match, marriage work as it is to what? To split the Red Sea. What's the connection? The Red Sea split. It went against its nature. Because water, you know, flows. The Red Sea went against its nature, right? So if you want a marriage to work, you've got to act like the Red Sea. You've got to go against your nature. Oh, to be nice. mevater. Malka, tell us the other. To be mevater, one for the other. The Red Sea was mevater. How do you say mevater? Um, gave it up. Made way. That's not normal. Compromise. 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 So, a well, marriage to be successful, you've got to act like the Red Sea to go against yourself. That's right. That's right. Difficult to do, but that's the key to a successful marriage. Yes, you spend your life trying to find out who you are. Right. And then you get married. And you have to For some people it is. 
Uh -huh. You have to be a Vatran. Marriage teaches you have to be a Vatran. Mida work. What? Mida work. Mida work. Victor Miller would say the Torah is a behavior modification program. It's not a religion. It's not, a, yes. It's God's authorized manual for living. It's Absolutely. God's personal authorized manual for living. That's what the Holy Torah is. If you read it, you see that it's not stories. It's Mamish Shirley GPS. God's personal system for a successful way of life. Now, Moshe Rabbeinu, <clears throat> so he runs away and he runs to Midian, right? And then he becomes, he marries Zipporah. Now, it's just amazing, Malka, you're going to like this. Moshe was a stutterer, right? He had marbles in his mouth. You can't always get what you want, but you get what you need. Hashem sends you a spouse to fulfill you. Moshe was a stutterer. He couldn't speak clearly. So God gave him a tzipora. Birds are always chattering and singing. Chirp, 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 chirp. He couldn't chirp. He had a handicap. So Hashem sent him a shidduch, a tzipora. A bird is singing and chirping. She fulfilled him. That's pretty amazing. Then she saves his life later on, right? They stop off at Motel 6, remember? Mm -hmm. And the angel wants to kill him for neglecting to circumcise his son. So who makes the Brit Milah? His wife. His wife. So the Talmud says from here you learn that a lady can what? Be a circumciser. But don't try this at home. No way. Right? But Mitzad Halacha, we learn from Tzipora, if there's no man around, a lady can do a Brit Milah. So throughout the Parsha, you see that Moshe Rabbeinu is saved by ladies. The first lady that saves him is Yochebet. She puts him in the box, the mother, the KGB wants to kill him. The second lady who saves him is whom? Miriam. She's babysitting him, right? And the third lady who really saves his life is Batya, Basparo. And later on, Tzipora saves him when the Malach wants to kill him. So the entire parsha, Moshe Rabbeinu, the greatest human being, the greatest Nobi who ever lived, is saved by what? One, yeah. one lady after another. Not a man. Elisheva, there's a message in there somewhere. Yeah. It's the ladies that save him. <laughs> no, huh? But there's no koinki dinky, right? There's no koinki dinky that the uh, Batya, this pagan princess, converted to Judaism, Pharaoh's daughter, Stalin's daughter. That's right. And she became Batya. What does Batya mean in Hebrew? Daughter of, daughter of God. Can you imagine from a pagan princess to become a daughter of God? Wow. And the Talmud says she's one of the few human beings that went to heaven alive. She's an exclusive company. Wow. Novi, Serach Bat Osher. Hanoch. Hanoch. Oh, exclusive company. Batya Bat Paro. From a pagan princess, she became the daughter of God, and uh, she is immortalized, and one of the few that went to heaven alive. Wow. So what, what a story this is, is teaching us over here. Mm. Pharaoh made the decree to kill all baby boys. God has a sense of humor, Shirley. And his daughter, who circumvents his decree? His own daughter. And she's right? It's his own daughter. That's pretty amazing, right? And this explains something very strange. The Medjish says, Malka, that even though the Jews were a memtesh tumah, the reason we got redeemed from Mitzrayim because of three things. We didn't change our names, we didn't change our dress, and we didn't change what? Our, socks. our language. No, we changed our socks. I hope. We didn't change our names. Names have been changed to protect the innocent. We didn't change our dress. And we didn't change our language. Because even though we're at 49 levels of Tumah, if you retain your Hebrew name and your dress and your language, you don't lose your identity. So even though they were Memteshari Tumah, but they still had their Jewish identity, which was uh, expressed through the Hebrew name. So isn't it strange, Hanoch, that the greatest of all Jews, he didn't have a Hebrew name. Oh, he didn't go by his Hebrew name. The Talmud and Sota said that Moshe's Hebrew name was Tevya. If I was a rich man, da 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 da. How do you know that? That his mother called him Tevya Atov. It's a pasuk in the uh, Chumash. Look at page two ninety six. One second. 
page 296, verse 2. That's Exodus 2.2. 2. You see that, Elisheva? Page 297, actually. The woman. The woman conceived, gave birth to a son. She saw that he was good. Vatera Kitov. So the Talmud says that at the Brit, she named him Tov. His Hebrew name was Tov or Tuvia. And yet, God never calls him by his Hebrew name. God only calls him by what? His Egyptian name. Isn't that strange? The greatest of all Jews, all the Jews kept their Hebrew names. And the greatest of all Jews, Dafkehi, went by his Mitzri name, never called Tov or Tuvia, which was his Hebrew name, but by his Mitzri name, Moshe, because Bas Paroi didn't, she didn't speak uh, Hebrew. So what's the answer? So the Talmud says something amazing. Hakora Tatov. Since this pagan princess saved Moshe Rabbeinu's life, God is eternally grateful to her. And therefore God never calls him by his Hebrew name Tov, but Dafke by his Mitzri name to express eternal gratitude and appreciation to Bat Paro who saved his life. So the name Moshe, which was an Mitzri name, became what? A Hebrew name. All because of Akara Tatov. In English you would say expressing gratitude and appreciation. And that's how the name Alexander became a Hebrew name. You know, a lot of great Hasidic Sherebis are called Alexander. Isn't that strange? Yamoid, Rab Alexander. So the, the Talmud tells us in uh, Yuma how he became Alexander. Alexander the Great, when he conquered the Middle East, including Israel, Josephus writes that he was very benevolent to the Jewish people. And as an expression of gratitude, Shimon HaTzadik, to express gratitude, said, we're going to name our babies, we're going to name our babies what? Alexander. Alexander. So that's how the name Alexander became a Hebrew name. One second, Shirley. What's going on over here? The awesome power of expressing gratitude and appreciation. You hear this? Ruti, you can have a seat, no charge. On the house. Gratitude and appreciation is so great that an Egyptian name, a Greek name, becomes a Hebrew name because these non-Jews did a, a favor to the Jewish people or to Moshe Rabbeinu, expressing gratitude. The name Moshe, the name Alexander becomes a Hebrew name. Yes, Shirley. What many women from Eastern Europe gave Yiddish names. One name was Shandl. Shandl means Yaffa. It's a translation, surely. It's a trans... But I know. But in Yiddish they translate Golda Zahava. What does Golda mean in Hebrew? Zahava. What does Shandl mean? Yaffa. Right? Right? Fegi Tzipora. You have the same thing on men's name. Wolf is Zev. Bear is dove. You have the same thing, but that's but not a problem. Well, the green was coming, yes. Yeah. They called me Shaylor. Right, but uh, that's a translation of the Hebrew Yaffa, right? But that's what right. it is, right? The Hebrew Yaffa. Right? Yeah. Now, Rashi says at the burning bush, a whole week Moshe refused the job. Says Rashi, because he was afraid his older brother would be upset and jealous with him. Moshe was younger. Once God assured him that his older brother is not jealous and not resentful, not only that, the Samach Balibo, only then did Moshe Rabbeinu Wat take the job. What about the fact that he had, hmm? had marbles in his mouth? What? What That's what he said. So Hashem said he will be your spokesman. Okay. Hashem said he will be your spokesman, right? But it's an amazing idea. Moshe Rabbeinu for an entire week, Hanoch. God wanted to give him a double job. Redeemer and lawgiver. That means he would get two pensions. You'll be the redeemer of Israel and the lawgiver. A double pension. And he refused because he was afraid that his older brother might be upset with him. That's an amazing concept. To be Michael, all that greatness, not to be Messiah, a fellow Jew. Only when God assured him that he does not resent you, he's not jealous of you, even though he's the older bro, and you're pushing him aside, not only is he not resentful and jealous, but he's happy for you. 
You see how hard that is, because normally human nature is that an older brother, right, a younger brother, older, there's a lot of rivalry. But Aaron was the exception, and because he was the exception, and he was not jealous, which normally he could have been, because he's the older brother, and bypassed for greatness, therefore he was Zolcha surely to wear the Choshen on his heart, the breastplate of judgment, because his heart was not jealous and resentful, Therefore, God rewarded him that you're going to wear, how do you say the Choshen in English? The breastplate, of the, the big kohana on his heart. So let's think, Hanoch, it's very natural to be jealous, right? It's human nature. How do you prevent jealousy? How could Aaron overcome natural feelings? Joseph and the brothers couldn't overcome it, right? Cain and Hevel couldn't overcome it. Uh, Yitzchak and who? Yishmael, Yaakov and Esau. You see this constant jealousy. Okay. They were okay. They're the exception. They're the exception, not the rule. Menashe and Ephraim were the exception. Moshe and I were the exception. But the rule is, it's the whole book of Genesis. You have dysfunctional families. Or you would call family feuds. How do you get by that? Emuna levatelet kina. Three Hebrew words. Shirley, you know Hebrew. Emuna levatelet kina. And not, and not Emuna. If you believe that God runs the world, and everyone gets exact, can always get what you want, but you get what, what you need. need. How can I be jealous? Trust. The big boss said he should get it, not me. So jealousy betrays a more moral defect. You don't have a munah. And therefore the Ebenezer says, the top ten, the ten commandments, don't commit adultery, don't commit murder, and oh, by the way, don't be jealous. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem to what? Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem to belong there with murder and what? And adultery. Why so bad to be jealous? Right? Lo, right? Lo tachmod. Lo tinaf, lo tirtach, I understand. Top ten. But why lo tachmot? So the Evan Ezra says this point. Because if a person is jealous, it believes he doesn't believe that God runs the world. Because if he believed, really had a munah that Hashem's in charge, how can I be jealous? So it betrays a deep character flaw. You don't believe that God runs the world. Because if you did, if you have a munah, the vatelet kina, what does a munah mean? Belief that God's in charge. And everyone gets exactly what he deserves. So how can I be jealous if God wants me to have that swimming pool and the BMW and have it? So uh, what shot being jealous? Or that greatness? Or that office? Hashem wants me to have it, I'll have it. If you are jealous, it means you really don't believe God's in charge. It betrays that, says Evan Ezra. And therefore, Malka, there's something incredible. Jealousy is a terrible trait. It's one of the Ten Commandments. But every rule, Chanoch has what? There's an amazing word of Basra. Kinat sofrim tarbe chokma. To be jealous and envious of your friend's spiritual treasures is a positive. I just told you, Elisheva, to be jealous and envious is a terrible sin. It's the top ten of the Ten Commandments. It betrays you don't believe in God. So how could a Talmud of Basra say yes? That's in physical possessions. But someone else's spiritual assets, it's a positive to be jealous and envious. Why? I'm glad you asked. Fine, That's it. But it's more than that. Hakol b'dei shemayim chutz me'yirat shemayim. Gemara Brachas 34. Everything is in the hands of God except fear, fear of God. Mm. So to be jealous of someone's physical possessions, Someone's physical acquisitions, that's a terrible lack in a munah. Because all of a person's physical possessions and physical treasures and acquisitions, that's not up to him, Avi. Who's it up to? The big boss. So if I'm jealous, it betrays a belief in Hashem. But someone's spiritual treasures, someone's spiritual assets, that's not up to God. That's up to me. So he can do it. He can be a Talmud Chochem and a great Cheshed person. Ooh, why can't I? God didn't give him those spiritual treasures, Avi. He took that on his own. 
So there being jealous of someone's spiritual treasures is a positive, as Elisheva said, because that drives a person higher and higher. But to be jealous of physical possessions, that's a no-brainer. God never gave him those physical possessions. God gave it to him. He didn't take it on his own. Unlike the spiritual treasures, which he took on his own. Hakol b'day shemayim, chutzmiyir at shemayim. And therefore, a person can choose, can choose, can utilize envy and jealousy in a positive way. You can channel it. You can channel it. Yes. Can we say that when the brothers, um, when the brothers developed compassion for Yosef, right? They overcame their jealousy. They they finally overcame it. It it was a struggle. It don't come easy. Who sang that? that it don't it. come easy. And the brothers, the brothers, Jacob's sons, they struck that sinner. But they learned to get a Muna. Why are you jealous of your brother? Hashem gave him the greatness. Joseph knew that, but they didn't. They didn't want to accept it. And, and also, That's the beauty of Judaism. Other religions cover up the mistakes of their heroes, but not Judaism. The brothers of Israel, the 12 sons of Yaakov, they are the founding fathers of the Jewish people. And yet the Torah exposes all of their sins. Tell it like it is. There's no cover-up. No other religion does that. That proves, Avi, that our religion is true blue. The Torah exposes their sin. They were human. That's the greatness of the Torah. Our superstar heroes were all human. And to be human means to fail. What? To be human means to fail. But, Sheva Yipol Tzadik, to come. They did Tshuva. Everybody sins. The question is, what do you do after the sin? The Russia remains in the mud. There's no hope for me. That's a Russia. The Tzadik, yes, I'm in the mud. But I can get up. And I can become better than before. Despite the sin, or perhaps because, because of the sin. Of in spite of it, or because of it. Because of it. Higher and higher. You have that in the physical world as well. A spring. The tighter you push a spring down, once you release it, it jumps up much higher. Mm. Hmm? It's just amazing that King David, when did God appoint him to be the Mashiach? Before the sin with Bathsheba or after? Bathsheba, not Elisheba. It's a great. After he sinned with Bathsheba and he did Shuvah, then God said, you're my Messiah. Say what? To prove the awesome power of what? Of Chuba, King David, the role model. Yeah. The poster, King David is the poster boy for Chuba. That's right. right? If I can do Chuba and become the Messiah, you guys can do Chuba too. Don't be too hard on yourself when you fail. Everybody fails. The question is, what do you do after you fail? What do you do after you fail? So it's having compassion for yourself too. I'm also Jewish, right? Before you can have compassion on somebody else, you have to what? Many people don't like themselves. How could you love a fellow Jew if you don't love yourself? A lot of people, you know. <laughs> I'm also Jewish, right? <laughs> you got to love and have compassion for yourself. If you don't learn that, Avi, then what? You, you can't have compassion for somebody else. There's an amazing Zohar. An amazing Zohar. The first mitzvah in the Torah is to get married. First mitzvah in the Torah. Why is that? Because the Zohar says something amazing. That a person cannot be madly in love with the one above unless he's first madly in love with his spouse. Should I repeat that? Therefore, getting married is first mentioned in the Torah. Only when a person has learned to be passionately in love with his spouse can he graduate and be passionately in love with what? With a Kodesh Baruch Hu. Therefore, the word, the word Echad, it's written twice in the Torah. A man should leave his father and his mother, cling to his wife, echad. They should become one flesh. That word echad is written one more time. Where? Shema Yisrael, Shem Lakein, Shem Echad. Kwinky Dinky says it's all or no. In order to attain the echad of Shema Yisrael, you have to first attain the oneness of you and your spouse. Only when you've reached that. Can you reach Shema Yisrael, Hashem Lekein Hashem Echad? And therefore this explains something very strange, Chanoch. 
The holiest book in the Bible, says Rabbi Kiva, is what? Shira Shirim. Rabbi Kiva says, right? All the Torah is holy, Shira Shirim. The Song of Songs is Kodesh Kedoshim. Rabbi Kiva said that. You shall mean the Torah to write down the sources. Why? If you read it superficially, Hanok, it's a, a passionate man and woman love story. Remember love story? It's a passionate love that a man has for a woman and vice versa. But it's only a moshal. It's really a dogma for the passion of love that we have for God and God has for us. So the question is, if you can go like this, Avi, why do you have to go like this? <laughs> if it's really a passion and love story between God and the Jewish people, so why do you have to disguise it? Why do you have to hide it as a passionate love song between a man and a woman when it's really about what? Us and Hashem. Why not say so? Why do you have to use graphic, such graphic physical language when it's really about God and us? You get a question? Because I told you. Because you cannot really be madly in love with Hashem unless you first have compassionate physical love for your spouse. Only, it's just incredible. The opposite of Christianity. The opposite. Only then, when you've come together with your spouse, only then, Avi, can you graduate and be compassionate in love with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So therefore, Shira Shirim is written as a love song between a man and a woman. Because only when you experience compassion and love for your spouse, only then can a person graduate and be compassionately, passionately in love with uh, Pretty amazing. I have a question. Yes. So, what do you do with uh, all the uh, Jews who they can't find, right? Rabbi Vigda Miller addressed your question. You heard of Rabbi Vigda Miller? Yeah. You heard of him. Zechus Who heard him speak? You heard him speak. Yeah. What a great man. Great. And he gave his shit up to his up to his last day. He was in his nineties. One day, and the next day, he just died. He addresses your question. He says, the single people. He says, God says, why are you so particular? It was up to me, said Ravigda Miller. The first one that says yes, take her. You're looking for Mr. Right or Miss Right? There ain't no such thing. The first one that says yes, go for her. And then there wouldn't be so many singles. Who are you looking for? You have this fantasy. Rabbi Vigdan Miller, I heard it on tape. I heard it on tape. Well, what, he made you, what do you do with it? The first one that says yes, you marry her or him. But you keep looking for Mr. Right, Avi, or Mrs. Right, it's never going to happen. I try, I try to do shidduchim with guys who, want, who are in their 50s and 60s. They're looking they for... The 34-year-old to be well, kids. Okay, they're not... Rea they're not uh, stick completely. Right. They're living in a fantasy island. Rig the Miller's Atal said, the first one that says yes, go for it. You're looking for Mr. Wright, Miss, Mrs. Wright? Mr. Wright, it's who can have, who can have kids well, with Our job is to try. There's an amazing, uh, you know, Malcolm. When a person dies, he's asked the first question. Amazing. The first three questions. Osakta Bepiria Rivia. One of them is Asakta Bepiria Verivia. What does that mean? Did you, Did you engage in making babies? So the Rasha says, How come God doesn't say Kayamta Piria Verivia? God just said, Did you fulfill the mitzvah of having babies? Beautiful, Malcolm. Malcolm Chavan to Rasha. Rasha said, whether you fulfill the mitzvah is not up to you. It's up to him. All you can do is asakta. Were you busy trying to have babies? Whether you did the mitzvah or not, that's not up to you. That's up to God. Whether you tried to have children, that's up to you. So we can only do our best and let Hashem do the rest. We have to be occupied. And it's an amazing tosfot. In Mesech Chagiga, Daf bet. It's important to know the sources. Hanoch, I know you like sources. Tosfot Chagiga Daf bet. Says something amazing. You got to sit down for this one. Every time a person makes love to his wife, 
even though even though it does not result in a pregnancy he did the mitzvah approval it's amazing Tosfot Chagiga Daf Bet every time a person has relations with his spouse even though it doesn't result in a pregnancy he did the mitzvah approval that's incredible and the Ben Ishchai says something amazing in Pashat Vayichi I know you like this also Ben Ishchai is in Vayichi every time you have relations with your spouse even though it doesn't result in the birth of a physical baby you created an Neshama and Shemayim I don't know what that means but that's what he says wow you created an Neshama and Shemayim so he says after 120 you get up there a person only has a few kids he has an army of souls up there hey that, I did that yeah you had relations and you created a neshama so says the ben ishchai you want to tell the other side of the story if you don't do it the right way well if you don't it's a terrible sin and then you get a lot of devils when that's you right right that's why sexual immorality is such a terrible sin where there's potential for great kid the marriage act is called kiddushin kiddushin you know where there's potential for great kiddusha the forces of Tuma what? circling around there since the marital act is such a holy act when it's done right if it's done not properly through marriage it becomes a terrible sin because there's constant tension between the Yetzir Tov and Yetzir Hara I don't hear there's constant tension where there's great potential for Kedusha there's great potential to Mount Zion where I teach it's surrounded by churches right why do those churches in Las Vegas Mount Zion where there's great Kedusha the forces of Tuma Avi they're there they're there you have to have that constant struggle right so therefore since getting married is such a great mitzvah the kiddushin if it's done not properly it's a terrible sin yes but it's very interesting that Moshe Rabbeinu was surrounded his whole life by by Paro and he lived in, in Egypt Prince of Egypt but is it that the Sitra Achra was he was protected from the Sitra Achra and he was able to to redeem the Jewish people at the right time was it in a way a protection that he was there so that so the, the Rambam asked you a question why did the greatest leader Jewish people ever had why did he have to grow up what in Cairo attend Cairo University Oxford right why did he have to be raised by priests what was God's game plan so the Evan Ezra explains and the Rambam explains Moshe Rabbeinu where did he acquire leadership skills where did he acquire the skills to fight for justice and right he's a slave in the slime pits so he wouldn't have that courage he learned that courage Avi in Cairo University he had to be raised as a prince an aristocrat so he's able to utilize that to what uh, to serve Amazon he was in training a prince of Egypt he was in training well she weaned him then she brought him back to the palace but who, who raised him after he was weaned after she weaned him it says she brought him back to the palace so he was he was raised there to acquire leadership skills and courage he wouldn't learn that in the slime pits so that's God's game plan to fight for justice and right that courage you only learn if you're an aristocrat if you grow up as a prince in Egypt Evan Ezek is another reason God knows his customers if Moshe would have grown up in the slime pits and he says hey I'm your leader right <laughs> who are you you're my leader I remember you from the slime pits you couldn't carry a tally of bricks you're the kid with the runny nose in the, in the slime pits there who are you the leader so he had to grow up as what as a foreigner ah oh, you grew up in Pharaoh's house you used to be a prince now we'll listen to you that's human nature so he grew up in, in Pharaoh's house, right? A prince of Egypt. And then he becomes a fugitive. What's the game plan there? Becomes a fugitive. And now Pharaoh, who raised him as a son, is now what? Out to kill him. Why? What's going on? What's going on? Says the Ebenezer, you're sitting down with Hanukkah for this? Moshe Rabbeinu, he was raised in Pharaoh's house. Pharaoh treated him like a son. 
His first playpen, his first bicycle, who bought him? Pharaoh. Right, Hanoch? His first tricycle, who bought him? His first playpen, Pharaoh. He had strong attachments to Pharaoh. Hashem had to make that break. No longer, forget your playpen, your bicycle, now you're the enemy of Egypt, because you really belong, what? With Am Yisrael. So Hashem had to make this, where he kills the Mitzri, and he loses all of his loyal feelings to what? To his stepdad, Pharaoh, because he doesn't belong there. So he does an act, where now him and the Pharaoh have this ir irreversible, is that the right word? Irrevocable? Irreconcilable. Irreconcilable split. Now he must rejoin his people after acquiring leadership skills and courage where? In Cairo University. So you see how Kush Baruch Hu, the great planner and everybody's life's like that. Yes. Why we had to go here, why all the detours in life. He has the script, we don't. Right? Hanoch, it's a game plan, we don't know why we have to go through all of the pitfalls, Moshe Rabbeinu, Prince of Egypt, and this tr tragedy after another, and marbles in his mouth, and he, Dafke, becomes the greatest leader of the Jewish people. So why did the greatest prophet who ever lived, why did he have to have marbles in his mouth? B -b 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 that's all, folks. To show us we can overcome. Beautiful. But Maral says more than that. If Moshe was a great orator, remember Abba Iban? Then the Jews might think, you made it all up. You made it all up. You're the great orator. Remember Abba Iban, right? But when Moshe spoke regularly, he had marbles in his mouth. When he opened up his mouth to teach Torah, it was Hashem's voice speaking through his mouth. Wow. Maral said like the ventriloquist. So God picked someone that cannot speak clearly, they all saw he couldn't speak clearly, but when he opened up his mouth to teach Torah, they heard God's voice clear as a bell, demonstrating that Moshe didn't make it up. He's just the conduit. Is that the right word? Yeah. The vessel Hashem speaks to. So he picked Dafke, a guy with marbles in his mouth. 